Hello and welcome. Thanks very much for joining me today for another presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series, this time focused on optimizing landscape photos. And I first want to acknowledge that I realized just a few minutes ago that we scheduled this this presentation for the day after daylight saving time in the United States. Hopefully that didn't create too much confusion for anyone in terms of what time the actual live presentation was going to be. But thank you very much for tuning in. Looking forward to the presentation today, focused again on optimizing landscape photos and essentially sort of looking at the key adjustments that I think are critical to consider and some thoughts about how you'll approach those in the context of landscape photography. For those of you that maybe don't know me or weren't sure who your presenter was going to be, I'm Tim Gray, and I know many of you get my daily Ask Tim Gray email newsletter that I've been publishing, uh, shockingly, for more than 19 years now. So thanks to all of you who welcome me into your email inbox each weekday morning. If, you're, if you'd like to get that extra email each day with a question from a photographer and my answer, you can find that at asktimgray.com. And of course, uh, primarily lately, we've been focused on both online workshops as well as pre-recorded video courses, all of which you can find at graylearning.com. And as a quick reminder, if you've got questions along the way, I know we've got a lot of photographers tuning in, so I certainly won't be able to get to every question, but I do welcome questions or comments, and I'll try to get to as many of those as I can throughout the presentation. But you can click on that little question mark icon over on the right-hand side to open up the questions panel, and then down at the bottom, you can type in your question or comment and click send. And again, I'll do my best to address as many of those as I'm able. But without further ado, let's talk about landscape photos. And we're going to talk about optimizing. And that, of course, gives us a, might lead us to assume that we're talking about the computer. And we most certainly will spend plenty of time addressing the actual process of optimizing after the capture. But I think it's very important to keep in mind that we want to start with any photo, really, by optimizing the original capture. And so for a raw capture, uh, for a landscape photo, I should say, that takes on a few elements that I think are standard and sort of common knowledge, but take on special importance, you might say, when it comes to landscape photography. And so the first, of course, as I'm sure many of you could have anticipated in terms of photography in general, but especially when with landscape photography, typically quality, detail, texture is of utmost importance. And so it is all the more importance that you're using raw capture. So this photo that you probably can't really make out all that well is not a landscape photo, but it's a sample that I captured quite by accident, but it provides a really good illustration for why raw capture can be very beneficial in a variety of ways. Naturally, we try to get a perfect exposure right from the start, more on that momentarily. But if you have a problem, raw capture is going to help you essentially work around that issue. And so here, this photo, I actually, it was just a completely accidental capture, essentially, because I was photographing, well, we were photographing birds, <laughs> as it happens, and then this bird, this airplane went by, and it was a plane I was not familiar with, and I just was taking a photo to document it so I could go look it up later and see what it was. And I took several images, and as the, the plane passed in front of the sun, the camera didn't adjust fast enough, and I got a very bad exposure. And so since I had this bad exposure, I thought it would be a good demonstration of the benefits of raw capture. And so I processed the raw image, in post-processing, so using Lightroom Classic or Camera Raw, but then I took the original raw, converted it to a JPEG, and applied, I tried to achieve the same result essentially, similar adjustments. And these are the two results. So on the left is the image that was adjusted based on the original raw capture, and on the right is based on the equivalent of a JPEG capture. So converting the raw with no adjustments to a JPEG and then applying adjustments. and the key difference you can see here, well, there's some color artifacting, but you see those bands of, well, basically shades of gray that we have smooth gradations on the left and very poor gradations over on the right. 
that is the key benefit of having higher bit depth. And that is one of the things that RAW gives us as an advantage compared to a JPEG capture. Obviously, we try to get perfect images right from the start, but using RAW capture helps give you greater flexibility in general. Uh, and I see a good question, Carlos, are the HEIF or the HEIC, so the High Efficiency Image Codec or file in the case of HDIF, are those raw captures? No, those are, you can think of those as an improved version of JPEG in terms of the capture format. And so that's, it's not gonna give you the full benefits of a raw capture. All right, and in addition, well, I guess <laughs> with the photo I showed you previously, there was the extreme version of that. Uh, in this case, illustrating once again the benefit of RAW as opposed to JPEG, but exposing to the right, which means expose as bright as possible, so the histogram then gets shifted over toward the right, but still not clipping any highlight detail. That gives us maximum information, which translates into maximum detail, which again is especially important for a landscape photo, and it helps to minimize noise, which obviously can also be helpful. And, you know, as a bonus tip, trying to minimize the ISO setting for landscape photography, very often we have the luxury of being able to use a very low ISO setting so that we'll minimize noise uh, for cameras where that becomes an issue because we're typically on a tripod. We typically have a scene where there's not much motion, uh, depending on, on the specifics, of course, and so we don't usually have to worry too much about the shutter speed, and so we can go with a longer exposure time as needed. And then also... Of course, sometimes you'll have a wide range of tonal values in the scene, and so you might consider bracketing to create an HDR. And especially, again, with landscape photography, we have a, a typically a higher emphasis on lev levels of detail, on texture in the image, and having, for example, maximum depth of field. And so even if you don't necessarily need to bracket, you might consider bracketing in order to help maximize detail by assembling a, an HDR image after the fact. And so something that takes on uh, special importance, obviously when you have the sun in the frame or something like that where we otherwise have significant contrast, that bracketing becomes possibly necessary, a requirement essentially to create an HDR image. But even when you might be able to get away with a single exposure, you might consider bracketing for HDR just to take advantage of that additional benefit. All right, and then I, I suppose before we start looking at actually optimizing the photos, we should consider what is optimal. And there are a variety of things. Obviously, uh, first and foremost, just a pretty picture, which in many respects means finding a, a pretty landscape that you'd like to photograph. And I would say also that the full tonal range ought to be represented in the photo. So very often if we're photographing outdoors under typical scenario, typical conditions, we'll have a good range of tonal values from dark shadow areas to bright highlight areas. And so we want to represent that in our photos. So we have black all the way through white, for example. Uh, accurate color. I'll put that in quotes, essentially, because we might fine-tune the color just a little bit, make it a little better than it really was. And then, of course, good texture and detail. And so those are the sorts of things that often attract us to a scene in the first place. We've got nice color, we've got nice tonal range, we've got nice textures. And then, of course, they're what we want to focus on when optimizing the photo as well. And as I go through the optimization, I think it's important to keep in mind that each photo is unique. And especially with some of the techniques that I'm going to demonstrate, it's very easy to sort of get into this trap where you're always being a little bit robotic. You're taking the same approach and using the same basic process to establish your adjustment settings. So try to remember that each image is unique and try to really focus on the attributes of that particular photo as you're optimizing. Uh, so for example, I don't normally convert landscape photos to black and white. Uh, normally, I find that the subjects I photograph in the context of landscape photography, they typically lend themselves to having color. But you certainly could convert a landscape photo to black and white. In some cases, it works remarkably well. And so all of the adjustments we're going to talk about, think of them as starting points and focus on interpreting each image based on the image itself. Uh, and good question, Stefan, in terms of I was talking about bracketing for HDR. So 
I think of bracketing as taking two forms. There's the bracketing because you're not totally confident about the exposure, and then typically three photos separated by one stop each. So we'll have a one stop dark, an even exposure, and one stop bright. Usually that'll work well for bracketing, you know, for that that confidence issue, you might say, uh, when you want to try to make sure that you're going to get a good exposure and you, you don't have the time to review. Uh, if you're using HDR, then you can separate by two stops. And I find in landscape photography, typically three shots at two stops will do the trick. But if your camera enables you to go more, so some cameras now enable you to bracket by five, seven, or even nine shots, Nine tends to be overkill. It tends to be more than you really are going to need. But I would certainly bracket by five to seven as a little bit of extra insurance, especially if, for example, you're including the sun in the frame. And then a question about neutral density filters. Uh, when I'm using those in landscape photography, I've been using filters from B plus W. Uh, I've had really good results with those, been very happy with those. And I typically carry at least a six stop and a 10 stop. And especially if I want to get some long exposures with landscape photos during relatively bright sunny conditions with a 10 stop neutral density filter you can very often get up to 15 to 30 seconds exposure time and uh, by the way when it comes to the neutral density filters that would specifically be solid neutral density filters my feeling is the graduated neutral density filters which have always been a staple of landscape photography or at least of the camera bag of landscape photographers I recommend bracketing rather than using those filters because the filters don't, the gradient doesn't match up perfectly with the landscape in many cases. If you've got trees or mountains or whatnot, that can start to be a little bit of a challenge. All right, and then let's then have a look at some of the processes involved here. And so we're going to start off, I want to try to cover both for users of Lightroom Classic, as well as those who are not using Lightroom Classic, realizing that we have a number of photographers in both camps, I'm going to talk about both Photoshop and Lightroom Classic, and specifically using Camera Raw in the context of processing raw images. As, and as I'm sure many of you have heard me say in the past, we typically, when we're working with our raw captures, we want to start with that raw capture and process it to perfection. But Camera Raw and Lightroom Classic, the develop module, are the same thing. They look pretty similar. Camera Raw looks a little more like the cloud-based version of Lightroom, but the same adjustments are found in Camera Raw as well as the develop module in Lightroom Classic. So I'm going to start off with Camera Raw. So if you're a Lightroom Classic user, you would just translate that to reflecting the develop module in Lightroom Classic. And if you're a Lightroom, if you're sorry, a Camera Raw user, as I move on to Lightroom, then just keep in mind once again that Camera Raw represents effectively the develop module. So I'm going to start off with tonality. So here I have a raw capture browsing in Adobe Bridge in this case. So I'll just double click to open that photo in Photoshop, which by extension means that we will see the image, of course, in Camera Raw initially. I'm just going to hide the film strip there. And so in Camera Raw, much like the develop module in Lightroom Classic, we're able to apply our initial adjustments. How are we going to interpret the raw capture? And as you could see from my example of raw versus JPEG, there is an advantage to applying the adjustments, getting at least the tone and color as close to perfect as possible when it comes to the overall tonality and the color, and I would say ideally texture as well. It kind of goes into the same category as the overall tonal adjustments. And as I mentioned earlier, there's an importance in terms of wanting to make sure that we have full tonal values, full tonal range represented in the image. So the brightest pixels in the image would be nearly white and the darkest pixels would be nearly black. Uh, I see the question about the filters, just a repeat. The solid uh, filters would be solid filters, solid neutral density filters. I don't generally recommend graduated neutral density filters favoring bracketing over that. And I've been using B plus W. There's many great filters. Uh, Singray makes excellent filters, for example, and a variety of others. Um, and then typically a six stop and a 10 stop are sort of my standard go-to items there. All right, so when it comes to overall tonality, uh, 
within the basic section within Camera Raw or in Lightroom Classic in the Develop module, we want to focus our attention for tonality on this range of adjustments here. So we have exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. And so first and foremost, exposure, if the image seems to be not as perfect as it could be as far as that exposure, if it very clearly was a little underexposed or overexposed, a little too bright or too dark as the case may be, then I would adjust the exposure value. The scale here, by the way, is literally stops. So stops of light, so I could lighten or darken the image. And in general, I would say that hopefully I don't need to adjust exposure at all. I'm still going to adjust tonality, as we'll see here momentarily, but ideally out of the camera, everything works wonderfully as far as my exposure. That's the aim in any event. Uh, I might, if I've exposed to the right, I might pull down that exposure just a little bit at this point, but quite possibly I would use my other adjustments for that purpose. So exposure is quite literally brightening or darkening as if we had adjusted the exposure at the time of capture. And so that typically is something that I don't need to worry about too much. Again, the other adjustments here are gonna kind of take the place of that as you'll see momentarily. Contrast I almost never use because I will effectively adjust contrast using the other settings. So contrast can give me a little quick bump in contrast. Typically with my other four sliders here, I'm happy with the result and uh, clarity might give me a little boost as we'll see a little bit later as well. All right, so then the most important, so of course I can adjust the whites, which is setting my white point effectively, focusing my adjustment. Uh, you can see sort of the histogram at the top right here uh, as I'm adjusting that whites slider. You'll see it kind of takes on this almost elastic form. You see that I'm stretching out the right end of the histogram, and it is possible to brighten the whites, to set the white point such that I've lost all detail in, in this case, the, the clouds, in the brightest areas of the photo. I don't want that. You can see that my histogram shows clipping. That mountain range, as it were, is getting cut off over on the right-hand side. There's also a clipping preview up at the top right. I can click the triangle at the top right to turn on highlight clipping, which shows red where the highlights have clipped, or turn on at the top left the shadow clipping, which will show blue in any areas where the shadows have been clipped. But my recommendation instead is to use a clipping preview in conjunction with moving the sliders, which is to hold the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh while adjusting these sliders. And so I usually use that primarily with whites and blacks. And so holding the Alt or Option key increasing the value for whites until we start to see clipping. Notice that I have more detail here. I'm able to see the individual channels that are clipping rather than just those areas that are clipping to white. And with a landscape photo, typically I want the brightest pixel to be right at about white. Maybe not pure white, but very, very close to it. So typically holding the Alter Option key, dragging the white slider over toward the right until the clipping preview appears, and then backing off till there's just maybe a few pixels or till maybe just the last of those pixels have disappeared. So maximizing the tonal range of the overall image in the context of at least the whites, the bright end of the histogram. And then blacks is essentially the exact same thing. So holding the Alter Option key, and dragging over toward the left until we start to see black clipping, the shadow areas clipping, and then probably bring that back so that we have uh, maybe a tiny bit of clipping or where we've just lost that clipping. Because once again, with landscape photos, we typically want to maximize not just the overall tonal range, but also the level of detail that is visible within the image. And speaking of that level of detail, then the next would be to revisit highlights and shadows. In other words, the overall contrast, mid-tone contrast, you might say, but focusing on the highlights and the shadows individually. Now that I've set the white point, I probably don't want to brighten the highlights because that might cause a loss of visible detail. But very often, I might want to darken the highlights. And one of the beautiful things about the highlights and the shadows sliders in Camera Raw or in Lightroom Classic is that as we reduce the brightness for highlights, Lightroom also, or Camera Raw, also adds a little bit of contrast. So you can see that I have detail in the clouds, but it becomes a little more 
obvious, you might say, a little more stand out as that detail when I reduce the value for highlights. So giving myself a little contrast in those clouds, for example. And then where I often break from what seems to be the norm in landscape photography, many landscape photographers like to open up the shadows, brighten up the shadows so that we can see more detail, more texture throughout the image. Personally, I tend to like a little bit more of a dramatic look for my images, and so I do tend to darken the shadows just a little bit in many cases. But the point is that we can affect this control over the level of tonal range and contrast within the image by using these various controls and an emphasis on the whites, blacks, highlights, and shadows. Again, I might come back to contrast if I feel that that's necessary. And then, of course, I see there was a, a question here. Uh, Robert, notice that the color space is set to Adobe RGB at 8-bit. Uh, is there an advantage to Profoto in 16-bit? Yes, this is just owing to the fact that I often have to process images for a variety of different purposes. But if you take a look at the summary of the settings for my raw conversion, I'm currently set to Adobe RGB in 8-bit. That is not what I would normally be using. Normally I'd be using Profoto RGB and 16 bits per channel. And so I'll go ahead and establish those as the settings. And then assuming we were finished, I'm going to use different images for different adjustments. Normally, of course, I would continue on with the various other adjustments for this image and then click the open button down at the bottom right. But in this case, I'm just going to click done, which basically means save my settings, preserve whatever adjustments I've changed, but don't actually open the image in Photoshop. So I'm just going to click done in this case. And we'll switch over to Adobe Bridge once again. And we're going to take a look at what are effectively the uh, texture controls. But there are three of them now. And so I'm going to start off with dehaze. And so here I've opened up an image that obviously exhibits a bit of haze. And down below my overall tonal adjustments, we have texture, clarity, and dehaze. And these are essentially very similar in general concept to the use of sharpening for an image. So it's like sharpening, but operating at a different scale. And so dehaze is operating at the largest scale. And of course, as the name implies, we can reduce the appearance of haze by increasing the value. And look at how magical. I never get tired of using dehaze on this image because it really is quite impressive. So it's sort of Similar in concept to sharpening, it's a contrast enhancement tool. It's just a really smart one that does a great job of reducing the appearance of haze in an image. You can go to a negative value if you want to add haze for any reason. But typically for landscape photos, we, if anything, want to reduce the appearance of haze for the image so we get more detail in the photo. Note that very often I find with a strong application of dehaze, the shadows may come out a little more blue, and so you might need to shift the temperature to a little bit warmer value to shift the color balance effectively toward a more yellow rather than blue appearance. Uh, very commonly I find that to be the case. And so then that obviously gives us a great result in terms of reducing the appearance of haze in the image. I'll just click done to switch to a different image here where we'll take a look at the clarity and texture sliders. And so Scrolling down just a little bit here to get to clarity and texture. Once again, these are like sharpening. So dehaze is our largest scale. Clarity, I think of as sort of a medium scale. And texture, a very fine scale for enhancing detail. And clarity, I think, is a wonderful tool for enhancing landscape photos. And so we can see a rather dramatic change in the image as I increase the value for clarity somewhat significantly here. And we go from, you know, an image that almost kind of sort of looks a little out of focus or, you know, too much mist from that waterfall up to having really wonderful textures. And as I've mentioned, with landscape photos, very often texture is an important element. It's part of the reason that I you know, typically enjoy photographing certain scenes. You know, here the texture of the boulders in the foreground and of the waterfall itself and the forest over on the right-hand side. And so I do find that I often like to increase that clarity value a fair amount for landscape photos. And then if there's fine texture, which isn't 
exactly the case with this particular image, but I'll just use the same image here to illustrate that concept. Texture is like clarity or like sharpening, just happening at a smaller scale, and so it's going to bring out all of the little nooks and crannies. So if we had very fine textures uh, in the foreground, for example, if we had, you know, a, a forest where, you know, the pine needles we really want to have stand out, if it's an evergreen forest, for example, then we might use a relatively high value for texture. Being careful not to get the image kind of looking a little bit too crunchy, sort of over-sharpened type of a look in the image, but just trying to make sure that we're enhancing that detail as best we can. And so all three of those sliders, I think, can play a role in a landscape photo, and you can sort of mix and match a little bit and focus once again on trying to just get that detail to really stand out, to, to have a little bit more uh, impressive look to it. And I uh, saw the question here from Frank about the auto button, or well, comment really, that he's found that the auto button does a good job for starting editing. And yes, that's absolutely true. So the auto button that is available will essentially apply these adjustments for you that I've just been working with. It will apply them. In fact, let's go ahead and see. Wow, <laughs> not very good in this case. Um, so, but he, <laughs> Frank is right though, that very often clicking that auto button will give you a good starting point for an image. And I have found that most of the time it gives you a better starting point than the neutral settings. Sometimes it gets things, you know, it gets things wrong from time to time, but more often than not, it gives you a little bit of an improvement over the initial and sometimes a significant improvement depending on the image. I uh, see so Herbert's question about the alt or option key. Does that work for highlights? Yes, it does work for highlights and shadows. So in this case, I might not have any clipping. No, I don't in this case. Uh, let's take that a little bit further. And now as we work with highlights, I can see that clipping preview. So if I had set the white point right up to nearly clipping, then it would be important to consider that clipping for the highlights. But of course, if I set my white point and then use a negative value, for the highlights, so that would not be an issue. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and click Done and close out of that image, and in fact, I'm going to quit out of Bridge for the moment, and we'll shift gears and go take a look at Lightroom now for our additional images. And so in the context of Lightroom Classic, that means working in the Develop module, which again, represents effectively, it's like Camera Raw built in to Lightroom Classic. So whether you're a Photoshop user who's not using Lightroom Classic or you're a Lightroom Classic user, you can just translate between Camera Raw and the Develop module. So you can see, for example, here, the same sliders, if I just quit rather than what I was aiming to do there. Uh, so the exact same sliders are available as soon as I bring Lightroom back to the forefront here. An errant keystroke that uh, sent Lightroom away, but we have the exact same sliders available for Camera Raw as well as for Lightroom Classic. And so just shifting Lightroom here, there we go. And Lightroom decided not to open the most recent catalog, so let me just switch that as well. Bear with me. Uh, while I'm waiting for that to launch, let's take a look here. I know there's some questions stacking up. I want to try to get to as many of those as possible. Uh, yeah, so Susan's question here, can you define setting your white and black point? And that means setting the clipping point. So we're essentially, think of it as stretching out the histogram so that color values that had been, or tonal values, I should say, that had been a, a light shade of gray might become white or that had been a dark shade of gray become black, or pulling, and we do have a little bit of latitude for kind of pulling those details back if they had been lost in the original capture. All right, so now let's take a look at color. I know this is an issue that many photographers struggle with a little bit, and so when it comes to color, and especially for landscape photos, I think it can be very helpful to, first off, Focus on the temp and tint sliders. I don't worry about the eyedropper. You can click on the eyedropper, the white balance tool, and click in an area that you think is supposed to be neutral, and you'll get the adjustment for you. You can also choose, so for example, daylight as the white balance preset based on the lighting conditions. But I find that almost without exception, you're going to come back to the temp and tint sliders. So I think it makes the most sense to start there. 
And if you struggle a little bit, then I suggest swinging the slider through the extreme. So this is obviously way too blue, and this is obviously way too yellow. And as we kind of start to settle down that dragging back and forth, we can start to get to where we feel is quote unquote accurate. And there's sort of a range, right? So this somewhere in here would be a reasonable point if I wanted to sort of neutralize the color in the image. And up here, this is a reasonable point if I wanted to really look like golden hour. So there's sort of this range of reasonableness, you might say, of reasonable color, the colors that are reasonably accurate. And very often, of course, as landscape photographers, we might get out early or stay out late to get golden hour, and we might want to enhance that a little bit. So you might err on the side. When in doubt, shifting between blue and yellow with the temp slider or temperature, err on it being just a little closer to yellow than to blue, as opposed to being uh, sort of more of a neutral appearance. And then tint is mostly about color correction, so shifting between green and magenta, and usually we sort of don't want either, and so we're just trying to find the point where it appears to be uh, the most neutral in terms of those particular colors. So kind of shifting as needed. Obviously, you know, something like a sunset, then we might have it shifted a little closer to magenta. We might bring in a little extra magenta, for example. And then we also, of course, want to think not just about the accuracy as a starting point, or more accurately, I can say the interpretation of color for the photo, we then get beyond balance and to the overall saturation. And so taking a look at vibrance and saturation, our sliders for adjusting the intensity of colors. And so if I increase saturation, I'm getting colors that are more pure, closer to the primary colors, red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, and yellow. If I use a negative value, then I might ultimately get to the point where I have only shades of gray. And typically, I would say in landscape photos, we're probably going to be increasing saturation, if anything. And so we usually use positive values here, at least in concept. So saturation is a linear adjustment. Boost all the colors or tone down all of the colors whereas vibrance gives us a variable effect. It protects skin tones, which is not often an issue for landscape photos, but that is part of how vibrance is special. But also it has a variable effect where colors that are already saturated won't get as strong an adjustment. It sort of puts the brakes on. And so as I increase the value for saturation, uh, sorry, for vibrance, notice that the sky is getting a stronger effect than the yellow flowers, the canola field. And that's because the yellow was already highly saturated, whereas the blue sky, I'll reset this to its original values, the sky wasn't super saturated. Those blues are a little bit muted. And so vibrance will have a stronger effect on the colors that are not very saturated than it will have on the colors that are already saturated. And so in a way, it's sort of a saturation equalizer. So I can get those blues to be closer to the saturation level of the yellows, if that is in fact something I want. If that equalizing of those color saturations gets us to a little too much saturation, which is very often the case. So here I've got, you know, the blue is matching the canola a little more closely in terms of saturation, and uh, presumably that's what I want in this case. But now my overall saturation is a little bit too much, uh, which to Ron's question, he was asking this exact question about this exact scenario, using vibrance to equalize those colors, but then it's a little too much. So now we just use a little bit of a negative value for saturation in order to get those colors looking a little bit better. And so, you know, here again, trying to get color that is accurate and pleasing, which, you know, pleasing sometimes we go slightly beyond what's truly accurate, but in any event, something that can be worked with to try to fine tune and optimize that photo. I see the question from Norman going back to the capture actually, and what's the preferred f-stop, and very typically in landscape photography we want a lot of depth of field. We also want everything to be as sharp as possible, great texture and detail, and so typically at minimum you want to stop down a given lens typically by something of around two stops to maximize sharpness but then you also want to consider depth of field, and so it's a good idea to understand hyperfocal distance and to actually calculate depth of field for 
landscape photos to make sure that you're getting, hopefully, depth of field from all the way in the foreground of your photo to infinity. All right, so then going beyond color saturation, there are other issues that we might run into with color, and we can actually have a little bit of advanced control over the colors in our photos. So we might boost the saturation and shift the color balance effectively, but then we can also control the individual color values. And there's a couple of different uh, sort of categories, you might say, when it comes to those advanced color adjustments. We're going to start off taking a look at HSL, which stands for Hue, Saturation, and Luminance, or Lightness sometimes. And so I'm going to click on HSL there, and you'll see that we have these sliders that, for starting, we can look at the hue. And so if I felt that, uh, you know, my maybe my yellows were a little too orange, I have the yellow control here, and I can shift the hue, which effectively really means degrees around the color wheel, but you can also think of it as effectively sort of like a color balance adjustment. I can shift the color for the yellows to be more orange or more sort of green, and so if the yellows were just a little bit off, maybe just a little bit too orange, I can shift those over toward the right, or if the sky was looking a little bit too cyan, and maybe I want to shift that toward more of a kind of cobalt blue, or if I wanted to shift it more toward a kind of a greenish value. And so I can adjust, in a sense, the color balance of individual colors within the image. And so that gives me a degree of you know, additional control, effectively, along the way as I'm fine-tuning my colors. And we also now have a new option. It sort of takes the place of split toning, but gives us greater control, and that is the new color grading adjustment. And so here, I can effectively adjust the color, but focused on the shadows, the midtones, or the highlights individually. So, well, with the shadows are pretty dark here, so let's take a look at the highlights. I have the color wheel control here, so I can go toward a different color around the color wheel or toward a more saturated color, which is out toward the outside versus inside. So the middle of the color wheel here is neutral, is zero saturation, you might say, and then I can increase the value. So as I go outward, I'm increasing saturation, and as I go around, I'm shifting the hue. So for example, I could add a little bit of yellow to my highlights if I want a little more sort of golden look, probably not this saturated, so I could then pull. So the outer circle here represents the color. I can click and drag that to find the right color, the hue. And then the inner circle here, I can drag in or outward to adjust saturation. So I can just add a little bit of a yellowish tint, for example, to only the highlights. I could take those shadows. This won't be quite as obvious since the shadows are relatively dark, but I could shift those shadows into a different color value as well. So kind of a color balance adjustment of sorts in the highlights versus shadows versus midtones. So that gives us a very nice degree. Obviously, in this case, I've sort of made a little bit of a mess of the color in illustrating the concepts there. Typically, you would use a very low value for saturation when you're using these color grading controls, but they can be very helpful in terms of kind of tidying up troublesome colors in the image. And another option, I'm going to zoom in here. Well, let's not zoom in quite that far. The back area. So very often in landscape photos, we'll find that we have a bit of magenta off in the haze. And in this case, obviously, the red rocks are contributing to that. But haze also will diffract the light and typically give us a little bit of a magenta look. So using that as one example for landscape photos, but of course, there are other considerations as well, other colors that might not be quite right. So we looked at the hue, we looked at color grading, which is hue plus saturation. We also, under HSL, can adjust the individual saturation levels or the luminance or brightness values for individual colors. So here, for example, I'll increase the saturation first for purple and magenta, and you can see those are the problem colors in that area, or at least I feel that they're a little too much in the way of purple and magenta. And so, as I mentioned before, I could use the hue sliders to shift those toward, for example, something more of a reddish-orange value, or I could just reduce the saturation. I'll take those way down too far, and you see we're shifting toward gray. But as I pull that back up just a little bit, I can hopefully find, uh, right about in there, I would say, a nice balance 
for those areas of the photo where I'm essentially just toning things down. Uh, looking back briefly, I see Esther's question here about dehaze versus clarity and texture, sort of which order would you use? And I would say generally, if dehaze is needed at all, I usually apply that first and then work down. So I usually work from largest to smallest as needed. So dehaze followed by clarity, followed by texture, mostly just a matter of personal preference, really. And uh, yeah, so a couple of you have mentioned the profiles and specifically that there are among the list here, one of our options for our initial interpretation of color in the image is Adobe Landscape. There are a variety of profiles available. We can use the profile browser and you'll find that there are in fact a variety of creative effects available here as well. And so a couple of you noting that you found that Adobe Landscape often gives you a better starting point for a landscape photo. And I don't happen to use those profiles much. I usually leave this set to Adobe Color, but certainly if you're finding that's giving you closer to a result that you are happy with, it's really just an initial interpretation of the photo. And so I can certainly obviously adjust the color with the various other adjustments I've used here. So the overall white balance adjustments as well as saturation adjustments and then getting into those sort of more detailed level of adjustments as well. And so, you know, I would say that that the profiles represent a good starting point. So if you're finding that a, a particular starting point is a, a better starting point, then absolutely, I think that's a great approach. And in fact, that's something that I might create a preset for that in the context of Lightroom, I would then apply during import. Another consideration, landscape photography very often involves wide angle lenses. Not exclusively, of course, but as landscape photographers, I think you'll find that very often you are using wide angle lenses. You're showing a wide landscape. You're including a large area of the scene in the frame. And as I'm sure you're all familiar, wide angle lenses tend to have a little bit of distortion. And so the lens corrections adjustments can be very helpful for landscape photos. And as a general rule, this is something that I typically apply during import. And so this is something that normally is applied to every image that I've brought into my Lightroom Classic catalog. First and foremost is to remove chromatic aberration, and this will get rid of that color fringing that might occur with, for example, backlit scenes. And chromatic aberrations are generally more prevalent with wide angle lenses, so it does tend to be a potential issue for landscape photos. But then the, the primary reason to be here, I suppose you could say in the lens corrections, is to enable the profile-based corrections. Lightroom Classic and Camera Raw include the ability to apply adjustments based on the behavior of the lens. And so for wide angle lenses, that often means a bit of distortion and a bit of vignetting. And you can sort of maybe see the vignetting here, especially at the bottom corners of the image. I'll turn on profile correction. And then as needed, if you don't see the lens profile selected here, I generally start by choosing auto. And sometimes that works. And sometimes as you see here, it breaks it. If that doesn't work, then I would select the manufacturer of the lens, not of the camera, but of the lens, and that usually will get that profile selected correctly. If not, you can also choose the specific lens that was used, and then as applicable, choose the profile. Once you've selected a lens, the profile is usually set automatically, but not every lens is supported, of course, so you'll find certain makes are not going to be covered and certain lenses not covered. But now toggling that checkbox off and then on again you'll see that we have a distortion correction, barrel versus pincushion distortion correction, as well as a correction for the vignetting. We can fine tune with the distortion and vignetting sliders down below as needed if things were not quite perfect. Uh, I can always vignette later. I would use the post crop vignetting if you want a creative vignetting because as the name implies, that will follow the crop. So this vignetting correction is for the behavior of the lens. So if you don't like the vignetting that the lens gave you, then you can compensate for it. If you want creative vignetting, then I would use post-crop vignetting for that purpose. And then, of course, we usually are cropping within the camera and assembling, hopefully getting a perfect result right in the camera, ideally. <laughs> we frame up the scene just the way we want it, and we get that horizon line perfectly, horizontal, perfectly straight, 
but still you may find that you want to crop either to straighten out the horizon or just to fine-tune the composition a little bit, or as is the case here, you might notice this little white stripe up at the top center of the image as well as down at the bottom center, and that is owing to corrections that were applied. This is actually an HDR image, so assembled from a set of bracketed raw captures, and so as part of that process, there was a, a lack of alignment, and so there's a little bit of area that, that the images didn't quite overlap, and so I would need to crop, and so I could choose my crop tool here, for example, and then at bare minimum, I'd want to maybe drag the top edge and the bottom edge inward just a little bit. I could crop as well from the left or right side. So for example, you might be able to tell in this case, the sun is not actually centered. So I'm gonna go up to the menu and go to tools, followed by crop guide overlay, and either use grid, or there's a relatively new option here as well for center, meaning I want to be able to center things up here. And that gives me that crosshair effectively so I can crop from the left in order to get that sun hopefully perfectly centered horizontally. And again, I can then fine tune my overall crop as I see fit. And if I need to rotate, I can click and drag outside of the crop box. Or in this case, I've got these rolling hills. It makes it a little bit tricky. If I had a straight horizon, I could click on the angle tool click and drag across a line that should be straight, and that will be set as my straight line. Here I'll kind of eyeball it based on rotating. So clicking outside the crop box and dragging in order to rotate the image, fine tune that left side just a little bit, and click done, and hopefully that takes care of my overall crop. And, oh and yeah, so there was a question there about the auto button, that is still available in Lightroom Classic, and so we have, it's just in a slightly different position, but you can see right there for Lightroom users is the auto button that was also in Camera Raw, just in a slightly different place, so you might not have caught that button. And then finally, I wanna show just a quick demo to illustrate the notion of if you're a Lightroom Classic user sending images over to Photoshop. Here, for example, I have some dust spots on the sensor. And so I would wanna clean those up. It's possible to clean up dust spots in Lightroom Classic, but it's lacking the content aware technology from Photoshop that is so tremendously helpful. And so just a quick overview of that process after selecting an image and probably fine tuning all the various adjustments in that we've talked about so far, and maybe more, then we could send the image over to Photoshop. So photo, edit in, and then edit in Adobe Photoshop, and that will send this image over to Photoshop, creating a derivative image as part of that process. So depending on your preferences in Lightroom, then you might have, you'll be creating either a TIFF or a PSD file. And not going into extensive detail here in the context of Photoshop, but I'll click to create a new layer, a new empty image layer, so that I can do my image cleanup work non-destructively. I will double click on the name of that new layer in order to rename it, and so I'll just type image cleanup and press enter or return on the keyboard. And my go-to tool in Photoshop is the Spot Healing Brush tool, and so I would choose that tool and make sure that number one, Content Aware is selected on the options bar up at the top, and then that sample all layers is also turned on, and then I can zoom in on those spots and use the left and right square bracket keys on the keyboard, left square bracket to reduce the brush size, right square bracket to increase the brush size, and then I can just click on any spots or as needed and wait for Photoshop to catch up with me here. And then I could also click and drag. So here we've got this little sort of streak of some sort there. And so I can click and drag on that spot and then click on additional spots as needed to clean up the overall image. And so Photoshop taking an extended break here. There we go. And there's some other spots. I won't worry about cleaning up all of those at the moment, uh, just in the interest of time. The point being is that we're able to use a variety of tools, but the starting point would be that spot healing brush tool within Photoshop. And when you've sent an image from Lightroom to Photoshop, when you're finished, do not save as. Simply use File Save or the keyboard shortcut. And essentially Lightroom has told Photoshop where to save the file and what to call it.
So that's all handled for you automatically. If you use Save As, you might confuse Lightroom and then your image would suddenly no longer be available, uh, would be not included in your Lightroom Classic catalog. So just File, Save, and then File, Close. And that will, if we go back over to Lightroom, will show us that we then have our derivative image, so a TIFF image in this case. And I do want to at least briefly, and then I will get to some of the questions. I know there's been some questions coming in here while I've been busy talking about optimizing these photos. But I'm going to send another image over into Photoshop. And just to emphasize that targeted adjustments are also something that I recommend doing in the context of Photoshop rather than Lightroom Classic. And so my standard starting tool for creating selections would be the Quick Selection tool. And that enables me to just kind of paint over an area in the image and build up a selection. So I'm able to, for example, select the area that I want to apply an adjustment to. There's also, if we go to the Select menu, a new option called Select Sky. And so I'm going to choose Select from the menu followed by Sky and then wait for Photoshop to analyze the image through the use of artificial intelligence and all sorts of really impressive technology to create what looks to be a very good selection of the sky in this case. And yes, this usually works well if you have things like trees that are sort of breaking up the sky. And then with a selection, if you add an adjustment layer, so I'll click on the Add Adjustment Layer button, and let's just use a Curves Adjustment for example. When I add an adjustment layer with a selection active, I'm adding an adjustment layer on my Layers panel, of course, and because I had a selection active when I added that adjustment layer, the layer mask associated with my adjustment layer will reflect the shape of my selection so that I am now applying my adjustment only to, in this case, the sky, only to the area that I had selected. I can click on the thumbnail for the mask or choose the Masks option on the Properties panel, and then I can do things like feather that selection. I'll over feather it, uh, and so we can get a little bit of a sense, hopefully, in that preview, a reasonable sense. A little difficult to see there. In fact, let me make the adjustment wildly exaggerated so that we can better see the effect of that feathering. And so you'll see that halo starting to form around the bar, the barn. So do I want a very tight transition or a fairly smooth transition? And that depends, of course, on the edge of what we're adjusting versus not adjusting, but able to then blend that adjustment into the areas that are being adjusted versus not adjusted. And then once again, file save from the menu, not save as. And then when that it process is finished, once the image is saved, then we can close the image. And once again, we'll find that when we get back into Lightroom Classic, the derivative, so here's my TIFF version of the image versus the original raw capture. And I could, of course, send that image back over to Photoshop as needed uh, using, by the way, the edit original option. If I send a TIFF or PSD over to Photoshop, it's going to ask me, what do I want to do? And that's because it's not a raw capture. And I generally want to use edit original so that I'm sending that TIFF or PSD back to Photoshop for further editing, keeping all of my layers as part of that process. And yes, Susan, uh, is this session being recorded? Yes, absolutely. And we'll send a follow-up email once that recording is published later today to let you know that that is available. And let's see, taking a look at some of the questions here. Uh, do you save differently if you're using Camera Raw, if you're, well, if you're not using Lightroom Classic? And I would say, no, it's same basic concept you just be saving. Obviously, if we've opened up a raw capture and you choose save, so in fact, let's go ahead and do exactly that. Let me pull up an image here. Bear with me just a moment. And, well, we'll just open one of our recent images as a matter of fact. Oh no, actually, I didn't actually open those, so we'll get back to I'll bring up Adobe Bridge here. Bear with me just a moment while I'm waiting for that to pull up. Ah, oh, yeah, so Linda's question, why not remove spots in Lightroom? And that's primarily because Lightroom Classic does not have the content-aware technology. And so the quality of that cleanup, the accuracy, effectively, of that cleanup will be improved if you use Photoshop rather than Lightroom Classic. I keep hoping that Adobe 
will update Lightroom Classic to include that content-aware technology, but thus far, they have not. All right. And so if I open this image, then... So again, for those of you who are not using Lightroom Classic, if you were to just try and use Save at this point, note you've opened a raw capture, you can't actually resave a raw capture as raw. So when I choose the Save command, I'm going to be prompted to save as regardless. And there I would save either as a Photoshop file or a TIFF file. I usually use the TIFF file format. And so then we can include compression if we'd like and otherwise save so that we actually have that image. And that, of course, would be saved by default in the same folder, and so it would be right alongside our original raw capture, essentially. Ah, yeah, good question, Bob. So if in the context of a Lightroom Classic, the Photoshop workflow, if you save again and save again and save again, are you creating a new file? No, you're just updating the existing file. Yeah, so uh, good question, Donna. How do you reduce graininess and so if we go back into Lightroom Classic, for example, and uh, well, let's assume we'll go back. Well, this one probably possibly has uh, maybe a little bit of texture in that sky, just a little bit. So that would be our noise reduction. So under the detail heading here and mostly focused on color noise reduction. In this case, do we have any? Let's turn off detail a little bit of noise that was there in the original image. And so toggling that back on, I can fine tune the settings, of course. If I reduce the value for color, you'll see the noise starts to reappear. And so going just to the value that is necessary to get that color noise to hopefully disappear. The texture, the film grain or the luminance noise, that's gonna be a little bit more problematic because if we get rid of the luminance noise, if I use a setting here that is strong enough to get rid of luminance noise, then taking a closer look at the wheat here in the foreground, for example, you'll see that that luminance noise reduction actually reduces the texture, reduces, reduces the level of detail. And so you generally need to be very, very careful about that luminance noise reduction for the image. It's not usually too significant an issue. Uh, color noise usually can be uh, gotten rid of rather easily in most cases, uh, at least minimized significantly, whereas luminance is a bit more of a challenge. Uh, so, yeah, question coming back to the hue, essentially the hue sliders and a reference to the calibration section. And so how would that differ? So the calibration section is actually intended to compensate for a poor interpretation of the color from the original capture in the context of the camera. So if the camera has a tendency to make the you know, blues always appear a little bit too cyan versus, or you know, a little too much purple, we can essentially change the color of blue as it were. So very similar in concept to using the hue, saturation, and luminance sliders in HSL, well, not luminance in this case because we just have hue, saturation, focused on blue, uh, red, green, and blue, the primaries there. So very, very similar in concept, uh, just focused on a different aim. There's also a tint slider that focuses on just the shadow area. So if you're finding that your camera has a tendency to get shadows that show up a little bit too green or magenta, I frankly don't find this to be a necessary adjustment in most cases. And so I, I find that Lightroom, well, Adobe, I should say, has done a very good job of ensuring accurate color interpretation for the, the image, uh, for the original raw captures. And so those, uh, for the purpose they were originally intended, I would say, in most cases, not generally required. Uh, and uh, yeah, good question. Could, uh, could you use the adjustment brush for localized noise adjustment? Yes, except you don't have as much flexibility over the controls. It's just a single slider. And so I don't tend to do that. And I also find that it can be tricky getting a really good accurate result with the adjustment brush. So I tend to prefer to do my targeted adjustments over in Photoshop. And yes, would you sh uh, sharpen a landscape image? Yes, indeed. And so that would be kind of just standard for any image. And again, in the details section, applying, in fact, let's get something with a little more texture here, uh, applying, go back to the raw, sharpening to the image. Uh, 
and holding the Alt or Option key to get a preview of that effect and using a moderate setting for amount, so typically somewhere in the general vicinity of 75, uh, 50 to 75, somewhere in that range is probably gonna work well for landscape photos, but holding the Alt or Option key to get, in this case, a grayscale preview that gives you a better sense of that strength and then sizing it appropriately. So for landscape photos where we have fine detail, more often than not, you'll want a relatively low setting for radius. So again, holding the Alt or Option key so you get a preview of that sort of embossing effect. And so typically a value of uh, at most about one, and very often for landscape photos with a fair amount of texture, a little bit lower than that. So somewhere in the you know, 0.6 up to as high as 1.0 range. And then detail enables you to choose the extent to which you want to emphasize essentially all details in the image. So I'd use a moderate to high setting for detail with landscape photos. And then masking enables you to choose, do you want to apply sharpening to everything in the image or zero it in on the areas that have texture? In other words, avoiding sharpening smooth areas and so, for example, the foreground, the landscape itself versus the sky. And so we want to find a setting for masking and holding the Alt or Option key so that the areas with good texture appear white in this preview and the areas that are relatively smooth appear black. And so, yeah, that is certainly something, uh, every image really probably deserves to have those sharpening settings revisited. There is sharpening applied by default in Camera Raw or in Lightroom Classic, and so, primarily then being a matter of just fine tuning for the landscape photo. Obviously each photo kind of has different attributes you might say, different uh, things that we're emphasizing and in landscape photos very often that's texture or at least that's one of the attributes and so that, that's something that I would fine tune there. And so I see a question about you're finding that the greens are always oversaturated. And yeah, if, you're, if you are finding that that's the case, it's not something I've found too often with very many cameras, especially more recently. But yes, you could certainly use the saturation adjustment there in calibration. Uh, great question, George. Do I use the tone curve for contrast? I generally do not use the tone curve because more often than not, I find that I'm able to get the adjustments that I need with those basic controls with in terms of highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks there. And if I feel that I need a more sophisticated adjustment, it often, in my experience, is owing to a particular area of the image, not just the highlights or the shadows. So we can use the tone curve. It'd be much like the curves adjustment layer in Photoshop. And so I can focus a darkening adjustment on just the dark shadows and the advantage of the tone curve is that I can customize exactly which range of the image I'm affecting based on their tonal values. So it's not an adjustment that I use all that often. Very often I find if I need that level of control, I've probably sent the image over to Photoshop. Uh, why not use uh, Topaz noise, uh, denoise, I should say, AI to adjust noise? No particular reason to avoid it. I just have been happy with the level of control and the results I'm able to get when it comes to working with noise reduction in Camera Raw and uh, Lightroom. And that's something that the that Adobe had corrected. Noise reduction didn't, wasn't always all that great. I think it was somewhere back around Lightroom 6 that enables you to, that, that where they improved the noise correction rather significantly. Uh, and yes, it is the, for those various previews, it would be the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh. And uh, you'll find those, well, in a couple places, but also over uh, toward the bottom left of the keyboard. And that it gives, enables a variety of uh, rather impressive previews or features, a lot of hidden features found by holding the Alt or Option key on the keyboard. Uh, and yeah, good question. Uh, if you, do you need to perform noise reduction before sharpening? No, obviously sharpening has the risk of enhancing noise uh, and noise reduction can mitigate the effect of sharpening. They sort of work uh, almost contrary to each other, you might say, but you don't have to worry about which order you're applying those within Camera Raw or Lightroom Classic. You can sort of think of it as the software is applying the adjustments in a particular order behind the scenes that you can't change. The order in which you adjust the various buttons and knobs does not have an impact on that. And 
Uh, yeah, good question. Does the sharpening have an impact as it relates to print size? So I'd say noise reduction not, in the sense that you just want to try to mitigate the noise as best you can. Sharpening, the final sharpening, so the sharpening we're applying here with the original image is compensating for the original capture. We would apply additional sharpening when we were printing the image, and that would absolutely be variable based on the print size. And yes, sharpening is applied by default in both Camera Raw and Lightroom Classic. And see if they, I know we've, we've run just a little bit over time, but let's, if, let's see if I can get to a couple of additional questions here. Uh, in spot removal, what's the difference between clone and heal? So when we're cleaning up spots here within Lightroom Classic, if you're using the spot removal tool, there's a clone versus heal. Clone means copy the pixels exactly as they are, which means you need to find a really good source of pixels that match perfectly in the destination area. Heal means adjust the pixels so that they blend in, so they match in terms of the overall color value. And that is handled, so this is like the clone stamp versus the healing brush in, light, in a Photoshop. And we have the additional benefit in Photoshop of having a sort of advanced heal, which would be that content-aware technology. And a uh, great question, Teresa. TIFF versus PSD, they're basically the same thing. A PSD file is actually a TIFF container. Uh, just kind of used in a special way. At this point, you can think of them as being the same thing, more or less. They're Obviously, they're not exactly the same thing, but they, for all intents and purposes, are in the sense that all of our features in Photoshop, selections, saved selections, alpha channels, layer masks, adjustment layers, image layers, all of those can be preserved as either a TIFF or a PSD file. Uh, generally, the TIFF file, I find, gives a little bit smaller file size, all things being equal. It will vary a little bit. All right. Let's see. Just taking a quick look. Quite a few questions here. And I'll try to address some more of these in upcoming Ask Tim Gray email newsletter. Um, but, uh, well, I... This is not a question, but hey, it's so nice. I'm all share. Uh, but this one apparently uh, Jeff considers to be a super great presentation. That they're all great, but this one was extra good. <laughs> so thank you so much, Jeff. I certainly appreciate that. And let's see, maybe we'll find one more question here. Ah, yeah, smart object. Yes, there were a couple questions about smart object. So when we let's see, I still have bridge running here. Let's open up a raw capture and in. Lightroom Classic, there's a menu option. When we go to Photo, Edit In, you can also open as a smart object. If we go to our workflow settings, so clicking the summary of settings for a raw capture in Camera Raw, you'll find that we have the option to open as a smart object. As a general rule, I don't recommend using that option. I'll go ahead and turn it on and open this image and now open as a smart object. What's really cool about smart objects, smart objects make for a great demo. And so you'll see that now, instead of just a normal background image layer, I have a smart object layer. And one of the beautiful things is that I can then double click on that image in order to bring up Camera Raw again, and I can fine tune my settings. So I'll just, I'll darken the image significantly just so we can see, an, well, actually, let's not do that just yet. But I can make changes to those raw settings. If I'm going to add a layer, and we'll just call this image cleanup, and I'm going to make a, a silly adjustment here. Let's pretend like I just wanted to get this, oops, I'm still, there we go. If I wanted to get rid of, there we go, this building over here, uh, we'll see, I'm sure the result will not be great in this case. I just want a real quick example. And so now I have my cleanup applied, and then I decide, you know what, maybe this image would work well in black and white. And so I go back to my camera raw settings here and can magically convert the image to black and white, except now my cleanup pixels don't match. So it's sort of an extreme example, but a short version of the story would be that the smart object feature looks really cool when you demo it, but in the context of a layer-based workflow, that becomes problematic in many cases. So as cool as they are, I tend to not to use smart objects. I see many wonderful comments coming in. Thank you so much. And yes, as a reminder, this is being recorded. We'll get that published and send a follow-up email 
to all of you to let you know how to access that recording as soon as it is available. In the meantime, thank you so much for joining me today uh, for this presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. I very much appreciate all the kind words from many of you, and I will try to get to as many of those questions in upcoming Ask Tim Gray email newsletter as many of those as I can. In the meantime, if you'd like to include the sun or the moon in your landscape photos or calculate depth of field and hyperfocal distance, very helpful in the context of landscape photography, among other types of photography, is a PhotoPills app that's available for both Android and iPhone, iOS smartphones. And I have a course, a comprehensive course, that covers all the details of using, using photo pills. It's called Photo Planning with Photo Pills. And if you use this link, timgray.me slash pills, that will add a discount, apply a discount automatically to get $10 off that course if you don't already, already have that. For those of you that are Gray Learning Ultimate Bundle subscribers, do keep in mind that this course is included in the Gray Learning Ultimate Bundle. So no need to purchase that separately. But if you're not a subscriber and you'd like to get that course to help you plan the details of your photography, you can get all the details with the discount included by using this link. So once again, thank you all so very much for joining me today. I appreciate the kind words. I'll try to get to as many of these additional questions in the coming days in the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter. In the meantime, thank you very much. And I'll hope to see you again in the very near future for another presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. Thanks very much.